So we want to thank everyone for coming. I'm uh, Max. I'm Max Nando. I'm the le uh, consultant for the Legislative Jewish Caucus in the Senate. Unfortunately, our assembly rep was called down to LA at the last minute. But we're really delighted everyone was able to join us. This came together initially after the uh, tragic shooting in Buffalo. Um, Salam with MPAC approached us uh, and was saying, hey, how can we work together to educate more folks about the great replacement theory, make sure that this is something that we have, that we all have a strong understanding about um, across communities and how it is really an issue that affects everyone. So uh, this is gonna be moderated today by David Carsley, who is the um, executive director of JPAC, which is a uh, major, uh, represents 30 major Jewish organizations within California. And so I'm sorry, Oh, Mariana. Oh, Mariana? Mariati. Mariati. Just think of Maserati. <laughs> Mariati. <laughs> Mariati. Um, who is the president of MPAC, a national Muslim advocacy organization. And we're delighted to have everyone here with us today. Thank you, Max. Thank you. And thank you for the Jewish Caucus for hosting us. Appreciate the opportunity to engage in conversations. As it was stated, uh, you know, there have been several incidents in the United States, violent attacks. Uh, against houses of worship, against communities, against the supermarket in Buffalo, uh, that were driven by um, rhetoric, some of which uh, was based on this thing called the Great Replacement Theory, uh, which actually started in France. And David Myers will will talk a little bit about its origin. Uh, but for our purpose, the, the origin is actually the idea that Muslims in France were going to take over. The white population, and and that theory, that conspiracy theory, it's not really a theory; it's just rhetoric. Uh, but in any case, it has now spilled over into American discourse, American mainstream discourse, American mainstream media, and uh, the incidents in, in Pittsburgh, which is being commemorated this week, uh, in an anti-hate summit in Pittsburgh, the attack uh, against the um, Jewish center there. The incident in Buffalo, Charleston, uh, El Paso, and several others, New Zealand, invoked the Great Replacement. Um, and New Zealand was the attack against the mosque that killed 55 people. So uh, with that is laid this idea of anti-Semitic anti uh, rhetoric, uh, that Jews will replace us, quote unquote. So we see that it started with Muslims, now it's attacking Jews and uh, people of color. And so it's an attack against all of us. And therefore we have to build a coalition around this issue. And, uh, and we also see that anti-Muslim animus and anti-Semitism are joined at the hip. Mm -hmm. it, these are two issues that its origin is the same origin, the rhetoric is the same kind of rhetoric. And in, in general, we want to see America like the Spain of the golden age, and not allow America to become the Spain of the Inquisition. Yeah. And, and for that reason, we need to have a conversation. Uh, and we brought two uh, experts on this issue, uh, and uh, we uh, look forward to working together on this issue with, uh, with David Bokarsley of the Jewish Public Affairs Committee and other Jewish partners and, and, and other coalition partners. And so with that, I wanna thank David for uh, bringing us together and, let him say a few words. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, thanks everyone for joining us both in person and via Zoom and thank you Salam uh, for partnering on this. I, I, I wanna echo everything you just said, the importance of us working together to combat hatred that targets both of our communities is, is more important now than maybe ever it has ever been. Um, and um, it, is, it is a privilege to be able to work with you every day um, and particularly to be able to share um, some of our, our community experts with our with our respective communities. Um, so I I, rep, I I I am the executive director of JPAC, um, the Jewish Public Affairs Committee. Um, we are a coalition of major Jewish organizations from across the state, um, lobbying the state government, um, and we think a lot about um, how we can combat hatred and bigotry targeting Jews and non-Jews alike. I mean, what's so important is to remember that a lot of this bigotry and hatred targets Jews and non-Jews in the same way, as you just said, and together. And um, by way of example, um, I know we've already mentioned some 
you know gruesome mass shootings that have that have happened in America recently. But but I, I want to say explicitly that versions of the Great Replacement theory were present. Um, in the manifestos of the shooters in Pittsburgh and Poway, yeah. um, where Jews were specifically targeted. Um, and in Charleston and in El Paso and in Buffalo, where other communities of color were targeted, um, with the idea specifically that Jews were the conspiratorial mastermind of, of this theory. Um, and so you can see the same theory being applied to target our community and your community and so many other communities together. Um, and that's why it's important to understand it and learn about it and figure out how we can move forward together, because together we will be able to effectively try to root out hatred. Um, so thank you uh, to our panelists for being here. I think it's time we maybe make some introductions yeah. and get into it. Let me introduce uh, my friend, close friend, colleague, and uh, really a, a distinguished person. In fact, that's his title. Um, <laughs> he's the distinguished professor and con chair in Jewish history at UCLA, David Myers. He's the founding director of the UCLA Luskin Center for History and Policy. He previously served as the president and CEO of the Center for Jewish History in New York and as the chair of UCLA's history department. He's the author and editor of 15 books in the field of Jewish history, including The Eternal Dissidents, Rabbi Leonard I. Biernan, and The Radical Imperative to Think and Act. And he also has this forthcoming uh, book, American Shtetl, The Making of Kiryas Joel, a Hasidic Village in Upstate New York with Nomi Stoltenberg. So with that, uh, David Myers, uh, who will go, who will deconstruct for us this idea of the great replacement theory, what its roots are, how it involves Jews, Muslims, Blacks, and immigrants, and why it has emerged today. Right. If you want, I'll quickly introduce Kalima yeah. so that we can we can get sure. them both uh, yes. out there, um, and then we'll go into uh, our history from David. So I get the the privilege of introducing Kalima Mitaki. Um, she is a graduate of UC Davis um, with a degree in international relations. She is a community organizer at Sacramento Act, um, which is a multiracial, multi-faith organization that advocates for transformation of our communities rooted in shared faith values. Sacramento Act works to equip ordinary people to effectively identify and change conditions to create justice and equity. So thank you for being with us. So we'll pass over to Salam. Uh, David, we'll start with a little bit of the theory, but we do want this to be a conversation. So feel free um, as, as we're talking for either of the panelists to be able to jump in as necessary. Go ahead, David. I think I okay. stated the questions and right, pretty clear. So um, the first thing to say about great replacement theory is it's a conspiracy theory. It's a theory that makes sweeping claims about various actors deemed marginal or uh, uh, superfluous um, in what is essentially a white, nationalist uh, political entity. Um, and what I would say at the outset is so particularly dangerous about a great replacement theory is that, as Salam suggested, it has migrated from the extreme fringe of the white nationalist movement into the media and political uh, mainstream. Um, figures like Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram uh, routinely make reference to great replacement theory in their uh, own uh, political commentary. Um, and uh, they have in mind when they uh, invoke it, uh, principally immigrants um, uh, who they believe represent a masked wave who will sweep over white Christian America and replace the true uh, uh, American stock. Uh, but it's important to know this, uh, Salam and David re recalled that the uh, chant um, that we heard in Charlottesville in 2017 was Jews will not replace us. But one of the most um, manifest expressions of repl replacement theory that we have seen in recent uh, uh, history. Um, as we also heard, replacement theory has been a common thread that links, I think, minimally Christchurch, El Paso, Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Poway. And in the great replacement ecosystem, different groups play different roles. Right? Not everybody plays the, the role of the actual physical replacers. The physical replacers are, in the American context, immigrants and, um, in uh, uh, associated fashion, people of color. As Salam suggested, or David suggested, the master manipulators who are intent on deploying immigrants to sweep over uh, and displaced white Americans are Jews, playing into um, a longstanding motif in 
uh, political conspiracy theorizing of the 20th century, uh, that is to say the Jews are intent on global domination um, and will uh, use all means available uh, to achieve domination. Um, in, in great replacement theory, Jews are often the deployers of um, the unwashed immigrant masses um, who will uh, uh, replace uh, the true uh, French or uh, American uh, stock. Um, and I mentioned French because the actual idea of the great replace replacement theory um, emerged out of France uh, about a decade ago um, in 2011 when a rather curious libertine French intellectual by the name of Renaud Camus published this book called um, in French, The Great Replacement. Um, and I had some familiarity with his ideas before, but I spent some of this weekend um, reading the book uh, to get a better sense of it. Um, and it's a very simple idea, um, and it will come as no surprise to you. Uh, the idea is non-French read Muslim uh, uh, citizens of France um, who are cast as immigrants are seeking to replace uh, French white people um, and overturn the French way of life. Um, uh, since Camus writes, they cannot assimilate into French society, they have no alternative but to conquer, to subordinate, to replace. So this is uh, a central motif transforming in a paradoxical but not surprising move. The weakest elements, the most socioeconomically disadvantaged uh, elements, the most marginalized elements of French society into a dominant group of persecutors, uh, a very common inversion in various forms of conspiracy theory. Um, what is unsettling um, is that Canu um, draws on past traditions in French political culture. And I'll read just one passage upon which he draws. Um, it's all well and good that there are, um, and I'm translating, so uh, yellow French, black French, uh, brown French. They show that France is open to all races, but on one condition, that they remain a small minority. Otherwise, France will not be French. So there is this kind of um, pathological fear of being overrun by a uh, immigrant population, a minority population uh, that grows at a rapid rate um, and that threatens to undo the very idea of French civilization. That's a term invoked again and again in, uh, in Camus. Now, what is important to note, this is in some sense, the latest iteration of a conspiracy theory that extends much further back in time. Right? This idea was not born in 2011 with Renaud Camus. It is a stock component of conspiracy theorizing already uh, in the late 19th century. Um, to take, to offer just two examples. In 1879, a guy named Wilhelm Marr in Germany came up with a term not invoked previously uh, called anti-Semitism. Um, he set out to create a league of anti-Semites to forestall the attempt by the Jews of Germany who represented a minuscule part of the population uh, to uh, 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 achieve decisive victory over Germany. The, the title of the book that laid out this vision was The Victory of Jewishness Over Germans. Um, representing a kind of delusional fantasy uh, of Jews, a small beleaguered minority, uh, being on the verge of taking over Germany. A few years later in France, this idea migrated uh, across uh, that fraught border between Germany and France. Um, and a, um, a, um, a French intellectual by the name of Edouard Drummond published a book called La France Juive, Jewish France, in which he argued that almost all of the capital of France uh, is owned by Jews. Um, and the Jews are again intent on global domination. Now, I mentioned this and, and on subverting the French way of life. I mentioned this because these two texts are really prefatory to what is sort of the greatest piece of anti Semitic propaganda ever produced. Uh, greatest, uh, not in terms of its quality, but in terms of its quantity, its dissemination in 
millions and tens of millions of uh, versions. And that is the protocols of the elders of Zion uh, from the early 20th century, from the first half decade of the 20, 20th century. Protocols of the elders of Zion lay out a vision. Um, it alleges to be a transcript, a protocol of a meeting of Jewish uh, 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 business people from around the world who are intent on achieving world domination and in submitting, uh, causing the submission uh, of uh, Western civilization to uh, Jewish control. Um, it already, a careful reading of the text already reveals so many holes and uh, inaccuracies, uh, but the text uh, resonated and echoed in its time and subsequent. To give one example, the American industrialist, Henry Ford, the founder of the Ford Motor Company, uh, adopted uh, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion and indeed serialized it in his newspaper, the Dearborn Independent, which at that point in 1919, 1920, was the second most widely disseminated newspaper in America. He also produced um, shorter abridged versions of the protocols um, in book form um, in a series called The International Jew. Um, the idea was adopted um, by uh, anti-Semitic agitators who were very active and present in the 1930s, um, chiefly uh, Father Charles Coughlin, um, a radio preacher who reached tens of millions of people every week, um, which suggests that this kind of conspiracy theory has had deep roots in American culture. Now, at that time, Jews were the central targets. As I suggested, in the present day version of this conspiracy theory, the sort of framework includes Jews as master manipulators, immigrants and people of color as those who are being deployed in, under, in order to undo the American way of life. Um, I'll, I'll just offer one final thought um, before um, handing things over um, as to why we see such a significant rise in this, this particular form of conspiracy theory. We can go back and try and explain why in the 19-teens, 20s, and 30s, uh, the anti-Semitic version of Great replacement theory was, uh, was so potent. Today, um, I would say, first of all, just as a general historical rule, in times of political, social, and economic instability, xenophobia, racism, anti Semitism, Islamophobia will flourish. Mm. That's a, a sort of a goal, a goal a, an ironclad rule of history. Um, we have seen very considerable political. Uh, and social instability in this country, uh, certainly since 2016. And it's no surprise that we've seen very considerable rises in rates of anti-Semitic and anti-Muslim uh, incidents uh, from that time. Um, the COVID pandemic is just a, a kind of uh, fantastic breeding ground for conspiracy theories. Um, where did this come from? Uh, who is responsible? Of course, it ignited a a whole batch of anti-Asian, anti-Chinese uh, 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 claims. Um, and it too is part of the uh, backdrop to uh, the significant rise uh, of, um, uh, of conspiracy theories along the lines of the Great Replacement. Um, the crisis of American democracy is, uh, is um, obvious and there's too much to be said about that. Um, maybe we'll unpack a little bit more. And then just a, a fourth factor that I mentioned, that I mentioned especially when thinking about great replacement, is backlash to the election of Barack Obama as president of the United States. Um, we still haven't assessed fully, I think, the impact of that backlash um, against uh, an African-American as president of the United States. Um, there's much more to be said. Um, I think our job here is to expose both the fallacy and the peril that lurks in a great replacement theory. And we can perhaps think together about how to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, so now we'll, we'll turn to Kalima. Um, I would love to hear from you. Now, you, you're doing community organizing, um, coalition building. Um, and um, so before we get into the work that you do, I'd love for you if you can just take a step back and, and tell us a little bit about 
how white supremacy and, and the form of great replacement theory that Professor Myers has brought to us, how, how it's manifested in many ways in white supremacy. How, how does that look um, in your community today? Um, and how have you seen this change over the course of your life and your work? Yeah, um, the way that I like to think of white supremacy is as a poison. Um, and so the way that I've seen it is that there's this very visible aspect of the poison, this kind of state of emergency where we see, you know, um, hate crimes and, um, you know, people being targeted physically. And then there's almost this hidden layer of the poison that's just this like really deep sense of othering that takes place. Um, what I've seen in the Muslim community is that this happens both ways. So of course we see mosques being targeted, we see Muslims being targeted for hate crimes, um, specifically Muslim women who are physically wearing hijab. Um, but then what we also see is children in schools being bullied, um, people in the workplace being discriminated against. And it can be, you know, even the smallest drop of poison is deadly. Um, and so the littlest microaggression, be it, um, you know, not creating space for um, representation in the workforce or um, you know, mispronouncing mis mispronouncing people's names. Um, you know, that has a has a really big impact as well. And so, within the Muslim community, I think what we've seen is that it's definitely increased post twenty sixteen. Um, I know myself. I was just a little child, you know, when nine eleven happened. And so I kind of grew up with this knowingness um, that you know we as a people were um, looked at with a certain lens of hatred um, and othering. But definitely post 2016, um, I think I've felt it um, even more than I've seen it. And so, you know, I think it's something that you would hope that as time kind of goes on that it would decrease a little, um, but since 2016, and that was actually the year that I started um, university. And so I kind of got a different sense of it um, in you know higher education. But since 2016, I've only really seen it worsening, um, worsening both in terms of the you know, the deeper, more visible element as well as the, the more hidden element. Um, and I think there's also like a structural part to it. Um, what I've seen in my work in organizing the Muslim community here in Sacramento um, is that the criminal justice system definitely plays a role in kind of promoting the assumptions um, that this, mm -hmm. this theory rests on, this, you know, these assumptions of um, putting people into stereotypes and um, demonizing them essentially. And that's one of the ways in which the Muslim community has been affected as well. Um, mm -hmm. Higher incarceration rates, um, you know, police violence towards Muslims. Um, we saw that even here um, in Sacramento. Um, and, you know, I think that it's definitely something that we can come together to aid, um, but it seems as though it's it's here for the long run. So, Thank you. Now, very powerful introduction. Now, taking a step back and, and focusing on your work, um, you you do wonderful work at, at addressing hatred targeting both the Muslim community but also other vulnerable and targeted communities. So, can you tell us a little bit about that work and 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 perhaps strategies that you've harnessed to deal with hatred as a coalition? Yeah, yeah. So, um, as a community organizer, our primary goal is to develop um, people power to fight injustices in our communities. Um, and so my role as a community organizer with Sacramento Act has been primarily to develop um, a committee around criminal justice reform in Sacramento. And I'm now transitioning my work into developing congregation-based um, local organizing committees in mosques and masjids across Sacramento. Um, and I would say that that's probably one of the primary strategies that we need to have in order to fight this, is to develop these sac sacred spaces where people can sit across the table from one another um, having differences, but not viewing each other as an other, um, really getting to know your neighbor in a deeper sense. And I think one of the greatest ways to do that is finding commonalities. And the commonality that we all share um, as minorities and as targeted peoples is that injustices are being committed against us. And so when we're coming together over you know, the commonality of trying to fight against um, injustice in our community, um, oftentimes that sense of belonging comes with it as well. That's great. It, it, I, I love that you're, you're talking about people physically sitting together and yeah. saying commonality. Can you maybe share a, an example or a story of that, that stands out to you as a, a moment of growth? Yeah, um, so one of the committees that um, I work with, um, it's a local organizing committee at Mashita Sabor in Oak Park. And we, re we meet pretty regularly. We meet um, typically on a monthly basis. 
And of course, you know, it's a masjid. People come for Friday prayers every week. You kind of know each other. You know, you might walk by each other um, with the greetings, say salams. But when we have these committee meetings, we often find that people will find commonalities even going back to like when they were children. Um, so there was this really powerful moment where we were all sitting, um, you know, sitting at the masjid and we were doing this exercise that's um, part of the belong curriculum. And it's called this exercise, it's called um, I am from. And so you share um, different stories uh, about when you were a child or you know, growing up, how you how you came to Sacramento, um, you know, some of your priorities um, or um, you know, interests being in Sacramento. And so as we were going around and sharing, um, you we had, you know, people who had been there in the community for decades. Um, and they were sharing, you know, some of their family history of migrating from the South to California. And so to be able to see those um, shared stories of, and this is primarily a Black Muslim congregation as well. And so the shared stories of leaving one place and coming to another, um, and this is a common a common thread amongst many um, you know, Black Californians as well, of migrating from the South to California, being able to see that um, and see that the difficulties that they've still faced being in California and being in Sacramento, that there was also commonalities in that was a really powerful moment. And I think that it definitely led to at least the folks at our masjid feeling a lot more comfortable with each other. Mm -hmm. Now, can you talk about maybe co uh, more about coalition work across communities and maybe what what have you seen that's successful on kind of a larger scale and where, where also were there opportunities for growth mm -hmm. um, in, in some of this work? Well, I'll start with the area for growth. Um, I definitely think that interfaith and multicultural spaces um, are the way that we need to move forward. Um, and although Sacramento does have a strong interfaith history, I definitely think that it's something that we can live more into. Um, and I know it's hard coming out of the pandemic, but I'm really hoping that spaces like this and conversations like this, where we have people from um, many different faiths coming together to just sit across the table from one another, um, I think that's definitely an area for for growth, and I hope that you know a lot comes of it. Um, and in terms of coalition building, um, the coalition building that I have experience of is centered around issues. Um, and you know, I've seen success in terms of bridging people who are directly impacted. We, we call them at Sac Act, you know, people who are closely close to the pain. Um, so they're directly impacted by um, criminal justice system. They're directly impacted by poverty. Um, directly impacted by discrimination. And I see this bridging, bridging happening with people who are close to the pain and people who may not necessarily have any lived experience with the pain. And the understanding that's able to happen between um, you know, people who are close to the pain sharing their stories and giving some context to those who may be distant from it. Um, coalitions like that are, for example, participatory defense, uh, which is a program that essentially, um, it, essentially it's trying to get people to come together um, and have a group of people who can walk people who have um, family members in the criminal justice system, walk them through that process, um, you know, just be an ear, be a shoulder to cry on, um, as well as help them, you know, do a little bit of research for, for their family's case. Um, other coalitions, similar coalition Court Watch, um, that's another platform that um, we started about a year back that brings people, you know, just everyday average, um, you know, Sacramento citizens who can come together um, and observe court proceedings to not only gain insight on what it's like mm -hmm. to be in that position of you know, being in a courtroom and watching your loved one go through that process, um, but also to provide um, oversight for the courts as we know, you know there's injustice that happens in, in our court system as well. Um, so those issue-based coalitions, I would say I have more experience with. I know that there's other coalitions that are centered around um, you know, just building community and mutual understanding. Um, Sat Kids First Coalition, that's a great um, space for if any of y'all have kids um, to plug them into. Um, yeah, there's there's tons across Sacramento. Thanks. It's, it's really powerful to hear kind of how this, you know, you're, you're manifesting a lot of what we talked about earlier, this coalition building to to try to fight this and also room for growth. And now I'm wondering if maybe Salam, we, we can bring David back into the conversation. Um, and, and just, you know, I'd love to to think with you both and, and hear Dave, maybe your reaction to what um, uh, Kalima is saying about the Muslim community's um, current forms of experiencing bigotry and how maybe that, that can be tied into some of what you were talking about earlier, how other uh, you know, communities like the Jewish community are, are, might be directly impacted 
or right. involved in that type of work. Right. Well, insofar as Jews and Muslims are implicated in this uh, particular form of conspiracy theory that we're focusing on, I think we are therefore Jews and Muslims' natural allies in efforts mm. to combat um, this very toxic, to use Kalina's word, very poisonous mm. uh, form of political ideology. Um, you know, I think it, we, we don't want to rest in this position of uh, mutual victims of a uh, or targets of a particularly odious uh, political uh, ideology, but we do want to sort of use that uh, th that shared experience as uh, the foundation of, uh, uh, of a coalition to really engage in the first instance in sort of the 60s and 70s practice of consciousness raising. Mm -hmm. I think there, uh, you know, there are probably some number of millions of people who find um, rate replacement theory very satisfying. But there are many more millions of people who know nothing about it, mm -hmm. um, who know nothing of the stigmatization that is going on. And I think our first task is to raise consciousness of people uh, by making clear what's at stake. I mean, we're talking about um, not just a kind of uh, a, a mere assemblage of words. We're talking about uh, a political ideology that is actionable and has resulted in mass murders. So we, we need to together, um, and not just Jews and Muslims, but uh, other groups that are sort of implicated in this uh, uh, this very sweeping form of conspiracy theory, we need to uh, really um, uh, engage in that work together as partners in raising consciousness about uh, the threat at hand really to uh, a vision of this, the United States mm -hmm. of America. It's not, it's not just that uh, Jews and Muslims are targeted. There's really... Um, what's at stake is really a vision of the United States of America as uh, an open, thriving, flourishing, democratic society in which all can uh, participate equally. And I want to just, if I may, take the opportunity to say a word about an initiative that we're launching at UCLA yes. uh, this year, very exciting new initiative, um, uh, which is an initiative, sort of a major campus initiative, multidisciplinary, to study hate. Um, I want to tell you how it came about because it came about in interesting and uh, germane ways to our discussion today. Um, Chancellor Jean Block uh, would periodically call me up and ask me for my sense of what the temperature was on campus, especially um, in the wake of uh, outbreaks of violence in Israel and Palestine. Um, what's the campus climate like? Um, and he was hearing um, from a lot of community. Uh, partners that there was uh, anti-Semitism on campus and um, we wanted to understand and be responsive to it. Um, and after a number of such calls, you know, he would ask, what do you think we should do? And I said, well, what we do at UCLA is we study things. So maybe we should create a program or center to study anti-Semitism. But we knew at the same time that Islamophobia was very prominent uh, uh, in American uh, social and political life. And, we thought maybe study anti-Semitism and Islamophobia together. But then we sort of happened on to a, kind of a leap of imagination um, and said, you know, how could we study anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and not study racism, mm -hmm. structural racism in American society? And the leap of imagination was to suggest maybe what we need to do, maybe what our mission as a great public university is to do is to study hate as it takes rise and is transmitted from one group to another. How is it that hate can be transmitted almost genetically from group to group, from generation to generation? Um, and as we sort of pondered that, we also thought, like, you know what, there are a lot of advances today in brain science. Um, and you know, maybe we should see if it's possible to understand how he takes rise in individuals as well. And that set of reflections led us to uh, this idea to really try and get underneath the phenomenon that is so persistent and so toxic in American society and many societies around the world. And so um, we are starting um, uh, in these days um, an initiative uh, to study hate uh, we have 23 research teams on campus, ranging from cognitive scientists to anthropologists, sociologists, and historians. And the ultimate promise 
is not to add up the work of those 23 siloed research teams, but to imagine what together we come to understand about hate. Um, and so um, I wanna invite all of you to stay connected to our work. Uh, we're about to publicly announce the, the uh, commencement of this program um, uh, in early October, but I wanna give you a preview of what's coming down the pike. And I think it's obviously very germane to uh, initiatives that are underway in the California State Legislature um, and an issue of uh, great importance. Well, we're not seeking to erase um, the particularities of Islamophobia or anti-Semitism or anti-Black or anti-Asian racism, but we are trying to understand what are some of the commonalities that occur again and again, um, and how can we use the resources of uh, great researchers to understand uh, the phenomenon better. So I did want to just um, Thank you. put that out there as one thing that we think yes. that I think we can do. Yeah, and I hope it's useful for our, uh, the state government as well as the uh, federal government. Uh, I attended the White House uh, United We Stand Summit last week, uh, and uh, there were 150 uh, civic organizations represented. We were one of them. Uh, there was uh, also the ADL, the National Urban League. National Action Center of Al Sharpton, um, LULAC, a, a Latino organization, and, and many others. And what, uh, amazing stories of victims of hate that transformed their pain to purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we need to show those stories. And as we're studying hate, I think we couple that with these, uh, these stories that would be a powerful way of, uh, of uh, providing a counter narrative uh, to the conspiracy theory. But I wanted to uh, also ask, uh, th there was a key, a key word that, um, what's his name? Renaud Camus. Camus mentioned when you were reading from his book, is that we, Muslims, immigrants, what have you, uh, Jews for that matter, do not want to assimilate. And, and, and I, I've learned that that is a, a very charged word because that can be seen as we don't want to be part of society. We want to form ghettos. Uh, and in terms of Muslims, they accuse us, they call it stealth jihad, that we want to overtake the country and bring Sharia. And 22 states have anti-Sharia legislation as if there is such a thing uh, of a Sharia that is coming to take over the US Constitution. Uh, it just shows they don't know anything what they're talking about. They know nothing about what they're saying so but in any case the word comes back to you know we are not assimilating but in anti-racist culture and i you know and Klima, please inform us on this sometimes that's used you know the word assimilation is a form of racism as if we have to change mm. our identity to be accepted uh by the majority and and that in and of itself is is, is a form of racism so this is very tricky because if you don't have confidence in governmental institutions, that is the beginning of the end of democracy. Mm. And, and so we, we lose government, we lose confidence in these forums, for example, like they think it's a waste of time. And then on the other hand, they, they point to us, they see, I told you they don't want to be a part of our society. So how do we navigate that? And, and you know, I'll start with, if we can start with Kalima and then, and then David. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always question that, right? Like assimilate to what? And assimilate to who? Um, I think we, as people of color, um, as minorities, navigate it by just being true to ourselves and very unapologetic, um, form a, a very intentional sense of belonging in the cities and the counties and the states that we reside in, um, and take ownership, um, take ownership of bridging across cultures and bridging across communities. Um, but then I would also kind of flip that on its head and say, well, then why can't those who, um, you know, kind of put out this, this call for us to assimilate, you know, I think there is an element there of them needing to assimilate to a diverse, multicultural, um, multi-faith society um, that has and will continue to, to develop. So you're saying that we that we're still want to be a part of society without changing our identity. What needs to change is the pers this orientation to having a white majority society to a multicultural, or what's called pluralism. We have to, we have to 
ex we have to meet the ideals of what our constitution calls for, which is, uh, you know, all men and, and, and women are created equal and, and to be in, in a society that is pluralistic. Yeah, so this is a central theme in Jewish history writ large. I would say Jewish history in its grand sweep um, offers up a really instructive response to the question about assimilation, which I would say really should be understood in two ways. There's assimilation that leads to uh, the loss of identity, assimilation that sort of extends beyond the capacity to preserve features of one's own distinctive group. That's one way to understand assimilation. And that's a form of assimilation that many Jews and Muslims consider um, negative um, and not a positive form of, uh, of assimilation because it entails the loss of all connection to uh, one's ethnic, cultural, and religious group. There's another way to understand assimilation as a necessary quotidian daily form of engagement with the society of which you are a part. Um, There's necessary for society and for you as well. In other words, you can't engage, you can't survive in a state of total disengagement. You can't survive economically if you sort of live in an isolated cave. Um, so you engage economically and by extension socially and then in order to advance the interests of your own family or group, uh, you engage in the political process, which is part of the game of interest through, through politics in America. Um, and that's uh, another form of assimilation. Some sociologists refer to, refer to it as acculturation. And that's about really finding the balance between robust commitment to the common wheel and preserving um, a connection to one's own uh, again, ethnic, racial, religious group, um, which offers up cultural texture. Mm -hmm. And I would say that, you know, we might say that's just sort of a, a wishy-washy intermediate position. I think that that uh, engagement back and forth between sort of a core cultural identity and participation in wider society builds a certain cultural muscle. Mm -hmm. right? I think it's mm -hmm. an exercise that's animating, it's vitalizing, it's preferable to sitting in a cave and having no engagement. And I would say it's preferable to sort of full engagement to the loss of any distinctive uh, form of identity. That is what we're all engaged in in various forms. Um, and you know, I think Jews and Muslims know that process uh, very well. Now, it's interesting that uh, great replacement theory sort of makes a uh, contradictory claim, right? It says Muslims are unassimilable and Muslims are in stealthful fashion, seeking to assimilate into, mm -hmm. into our society. Mm -hmm. yeah. Take it over, mm -hmm. right? Take it over, yeah. That kind of inconsistency yeah. is a hallmark of conspiracy theorizing. And one should never yeah. judge conspiracy theory mm -hmm. by its theoretical consistency. That's a great uh, point. It's yeah. really often <laughs> animated by these deep contradictions yeah. in that point. Yeah, we see that um, in Judaism, too, right? So we, again, we see that in, in Jewish conspiracy yes, theories, too, the, right? The about take the, over. The, Jews the, are, yeah, don't want to be exactly. Jews are uh, Marxist revolutionaries intent on global domination, you know, right. to introduce a regime of communism. Jews are arch capitalists intent on global right. domination through the, the, the monopolizing yeah. of capital. Right. I'm, just, I'm just struck hearing you make uh, this point about Muslim conspiracy theories and seeing how similar it is, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that, I should say, that's part of the success of such conspiracy theories. I would always say that's part of the su success of, of anti-Semitism. It's staggering malleability. Right, the ability to assume different forms, in fact, completely opposing forms, and sort of get away with it. like, how could that be? That you could say arch capitalist, arch Marxist, communist right. intent on world domination, but we often hear exactly those things from the same mouth. Right. Uh, another question about um, this threat. So, the I, I believe the FBI and the CIA, all these intelligence agencies, have declared that white supremacist violence now is a greater threat than even Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And when Al-Qaeda and ISIS were the national security threat for quite some time after 9-11, um, there was this talk about, well, we need a counter narrative to what they're saying. We need a counter narrative that America's at war with Islam. And so the United States government went through so many uh, um, exercises of showing, demonstrating that Muslims are part of America, America is not at war with Islam, and so on and so forth. Um, what's the counter narrative to what white supremacists are saying today um, that they're being replaced? 
if you were well you had i, I do want to say one thing yeah um or do we need a counter situation yeah do we need another counter narrative is exactly what you referred to it's it's a it's a doctrine of cultural pluralism america's stronger when it is a map an amalgam of uh of so many different vibrant cultural ethnic religious uh uh threats yeah you know, the, the, the mosaic is is more not just more colorful it's stronger um, I think that's that that's absolutely the argument. Um, uh, I was going to say something else, but I, well, and, and and since you said that, no. uh, it's a cue for us to say that we we're preparing a policy paper on the counter narrative yeah. to the great replacement, and we, we're calling it the great enrichment. Oh, great! That we are in, and 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 it's it's a fact that we have all enriched America uh, financially, socially culturally, um, uh, food. Um, in, in so many ways, uh, America has been enriched uh, by the presence uh, of this, this great uh, multicultural society that Kalima talked about. Um, question for you, Kalima. What does it take for communities that you deal with to restore or to have any confidence in our government? Because I feel like that's, that's part of the crisis is that many communities of color have no confidence in their police, in their state government, in their federal government. So what what do, what will it take? Yeah, I think it's um it's on the part of the government and on the part of the police and on the part of representatives to demonstrate um, a very intentional care for these communities, to acknowledge the harm that has been caused, to acknowledge the history. Um, to offer up solutions. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I hear in my work is fund fund um, resources that will actually help the community. So fund um, you know, youth programs, fund rehabilitation services, um, fund tiny homes for the homelessness. Um, and so I think that kind of seeing the, um, you know, we always, we have the saying like, put your money where your mouth is um, type of thing. Mm -hmm. I think seeing that, um, you know, government representatives, police, uh, what have you um, are willing to actually put resources and put funding um, into the needs of the community. Um, in our organizing model, the first thing that we do is we go out and we do listening. Um, and the reason why we do listening is to figure out what the self-interest is of the community that we're trying to organize. Um, once you find what that need or what that interest is, we then strategize to try and figure out solutions um, you know, alongside, alongside the communities. And I think that's that's part of what what needs to happen is an acknowledgement of what the real needs are, um, acknowledgement of the historic disinvestment that has taken place on communities of color, um, and then a commitment to help them across the end. I remember what I yeah, wanted yeah. to say. <laughs> Go and ahead. On, um, Kalina just said, um, which is um, sort of I think an additive point. We need to think locally. Um, we need to begin at the local level. But we also need to understand the phenomenon we're talking about is a global phenomenon. It's mm -hmm. not an American phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason why is to think in my own idiosyncratic way of thinking, um, the way in which um, globalization has played out. Mm -hmm. Globalization um, as a very powerful economic uh, and social force, um, which is to say this idea of sort of um, erasing boundaries of nation states, of language, uh, of cultural difference, um, really as in the first instance, a project of um, capitalism. Um, and in retrospect, rather predictably, many parts of the world reacted against globalization and the fear of, sort of the erasure of borders and cultural distinctiveness mm. with kind of ethno-nationalist pushback. Where do we see it? Well, where don't we see it? We see it in Turkey, we see it in Hungary, we see it in Poland, we see it in France, we see it in the UK, we see it in Russia, we see it in the United States. I think we need to think our way out of this uh, uh, conundrum, because we're not gonna forestall, we're not gonna prevent globalization from continuing and sort of, we, we, we can't put that genie back in the bottle. But we do need to think of ways in which we can assure uh, people that they're not going to be displaced in sort of the grand, grand global economic order. 
uh, wrought by globalization. We do need to assure people that, you know, that they that their sense of cultural uh, distinctiveness is not going to be altogether eradicated. Mm. And at the same time, we need to, especially in this country, and I feel this with sort of a new conviction that borders on the hyper naive. We knew we do at the same time need to speak more about the common good. Um, I've become like a late stage uh, a convert to uh, redoubled efforts at basic civics education, uh, mm. educating the values of democracy, advancing the idea of the common wheel mm. without the erasure of cultural distinctiveness. That's that exercise that I think we need to engage in. Um, we should understand that at the local level, at the level of local activism and uh, interfaith and inter interethnic uh, work, but we should also understand it as part of a larger global phenomenon that the world is passing through. Thank yeah, you. You mentioned the, the common good. I just wanted to, a, a short story, I'll give it back yeah. to you, David, you can uh, start wrapping up. So I just had surgery on my elbow, and you know, this is why I'm wearing this, because my hand is paralyzed right now, uh, because of nerve damage. But in any case, so I go around, you know, I'm traveling, and wherever I travel, every time somebody comes up to me and says, can I help you? And yes, there is racism and bigotry, but there's really a lot mm. of good in, in America. There, there, there are so many, I believe that there are more good people than there are bad people. And we have to believe in that. We have to believe in the human spirit. We have to believe in this America that Colleen is talking about that is bringing all these people together, you know, e pluribus unum, and many we are one. We, that, that there is a common understanding, even and especially uh, with our differences, uh, that our differences are, are here to, to enrich our society, not, not to compete. So, you know, these micro goods, uh, as opposed to micro aggressions that I see is, is to me, to me is a sign of hope uh, that we can get through this. And that the 21st century is the century of, uh, of a pluralistic democracy. Mm. Uh, for our country, so that is I, that's that's a I love that that closing of of hope. Um, I I um, I'm thinking also about some of the work that's been done in this building. We're we're physically for folks online. We are physically sitting in the California State Capitol in Sacramento. We've got community members and staff members um, from the building here with us, um, and I, I've seen how um, the work that we've done has has um, has been able to. We passed some really serious legislation this year and in recent years to um, that shows a really committed dedication um, to working across boundaries, to understanding one another, to addressing globalization too. We, we are we are one state, but we people always use the phrase "as goes California, so goes the nation and the world." Um, by way of example, um, California just passed a major law um, that would um, help hold social media companies accountable to the spread of hate online. Um, we have our social media companies that have in, in, created, you know, helped, helped uh, you know, exacerbate globalization based in California. And our laws here, we have a population here that, that can allow our laws to, to, to make a broader than California impact, a national or global impact. Um, so I'm seeing the work that's being done in the advocacy space, in the, in the legislative space, um, too, to try to, to work together to, to create a common good. And it's done through coalition. It's really done through coalition. Um, we have an amazingly diverse legislature and an amazingly diverse um, capital community. Um, and there's, this is the start, there's more work to be done. Um, but but um, I just wanna first thank everyone for being here. I really wanna thank particularly our panelists um, for, for bringing your expertise, Professor Myers and Klima. Um, it, it's amazing, this is, this is just the beginning um, and we'll, we'll continue this conversation as we move forward. Thank you. Uh, and then la and we'll get pass it back over to Max to say any final closing words. Um, thank you. I just want to thank everyone again for gathering here with us today. Um, it was a great pleasure with the Jewish Caucus to be able to bring these amazing panelists together as well as these hosts. You all have done a fantastic job and we deeply appreciate it. We don't want to keep anyone here any longer, but thank you also to the audience for coming. And if there are, especially to staff, if these are issues that you're curious about, if you want to connect more on any of these, please reach out and um, we can either help connect with resources, we can help connect with the panelists, these organizations. There's a lot of amazing work being done and we want to work with you all to, uh, to bring it even further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody.